Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us for worship today at the Vista. Uh, whether this is your first time with us or you have been with us for a long time, we are always glad you've chosen to spend part of your Sunday morning with us here at the Vista. Uh, today, we're continuing in our series, How To. This is a series Austin and I have been wanting to do for a long time, real practical series to start out the year just kind of walking through some practical steps how to do some things in our Christian lives and this Christian journey. So today we're going to continue that with a uh, can be somewhat uncomfortable topic of repentance. It's, uh, you know, not always fun to talk about repentance, but let me just ask a general survey. How many of you are sinners? <laughs> yeah, that's all of us, right? Like if you're here and you're saying you're not, you're a liar, right? So... <laughs> What that means is we all need repentance, right? This is something super important to our Christian journey. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to start in Luke chapter 13. Uh, you can turn there, Luke chapter 13. While you're doing that, I just want to give you a heads up where we're heading. So next week, Austin's going to finish the how-to series. He's going to wrap that up next Sunday. And then we're going to spend about five weeks leading up to Easter in a series called The Last Week. And we're going to be walking through the last week of the life of of Jesus. And so that'll take us, of course, through Easter. And then after Easter, we'll launch into another series that will take us up to the summer. And so just a, a little bit of a heads up. How to wraps up next week. And then the last week, a uh, series, five weeks in the last week of the life of Jesus. I want to set up this talk on repentance um, by just kind of calling your attention to the fact that if you read through the Gospels, uh, the teachings of Jesus, one thing that you will see is how Jesus is continually reminding us that the values of his kingdom are often very different than the values of our world. The things that our world or our culture tend to value or put a high priority on or would consider normal or natural um, are often very different than the values that Jesus is going to say um, are the values of his kingdom. And so this, this is, uh, there's a lot of examples of this. So for example, if someone wounds you, hurts you, wrongs you, um, our world kind of says the normal thing to do is to get even, right? Eye for an eye, get your vengeance, get your revenge. That's what you should do. That's what you feel like you want to do. But Jesus comes along and says stuff like, love your enemies and turn the other cheek and pray for those who persecute you. And then he starts out by saying, blessed are the peacemakers. That's a very different value than what the world tells us we should do, right? Or our world values things like power and authority and control. And, you know, you climb the ladder and you work to get to a position where you're in charge. And this is something our world really values. But Jesus basically comes along and says, first shall be last in my kingdom, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you need to learn to be the least of these. And then he teaches his disciples to humble themselves and be servants and to do things like wash someone else's feet. That's a very different value than the value of the world. And on and on I could go, but I was thinking about the different value structure this week as I was thinking about repentance. Because you see, we live in a world and a culture that does not value repentance at all. Repentance is you admitting that you're wrong, and we don't live in a culture that values that. If anything, our culture more and more and more values, uh, in regards to sin, values tolerance, right? You could say it this way. Uh, our culture, our world, does not value repentance from sin. It values tolerance of sin, right? So those two things are very different, very different values. Repentance is an acknowledgement that you are wrong, that I am wrong. It is saying I'm wrong, and because I'm wrong, and because I've sinned, and because something in me is broken and not right, then I need to change. At, at its core, that's where repentance starts. I'm wrong, and I need to change. Um, tolerance is very different. Tolerance is basically saying, I'm fine. I'm fine, and I don't, I don't need to change. Nothing needs to change. Like, if anything, your perception needs to change, but I'm fine, right? That's tolerance. Tolerance is, let me alone, because I'm fine. Repentance is, I'm broken, I'm wrong, and I need to change. Something needs to be different. And while tolerance, again, is a high value in our world, it's, repentance is a high value in the kingdom of God. Whenever we talk about repentance and tolerance, inevitably, someone always kind of puts the two to, beside each other and then would say something to the effect of, well, Dave, um, 
Repentance isn't very loving. Telling people that they're sinners, that they're broken, that they're messed up, that they're wrong, that's not a very loving thing to do. Tolerance is, is much more loving and tender and kind. But in reality, when you really think about what these two things are, I would argue that repentance is actually far more loving. Repentance is far more loving, and let me explain why. If you truly love someone, you want the best for them, right? If you truly love someone, you want the best for them. Which means that sometimes to just tolerate them and their sin is literally the worst thing that you could do for them if you genuinely love them, right? And I could say this as your pastor, God loves you, Jesus loves you too much to just let you dwell in your sin. See, the love of Christ changes us. The love of Christ doesn't want to leave us in our brokenness and our sin. The love of Christ wants us to change to be more like him. That's what real love does. Real love changes you. And so the reason I would say that repentance is more loving than tolerance is because tolerance has no hope for you to be any better. Tolerance just leaves you where you are. It leaves you alone. It does not change you. Repentance is what actually brings transformation. Repentance actually brings change. And so we're going to talk a little bit about repentance because repentance is the only hope we have to become better, the hope we have to become more like Jesus. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus is going to mention repentance several times within five verses. Jesus is going to tell people that they need to repent. And he's going to, again, these five verses, and I'll kind of unpack and explain a little bit about what's happening here as we read Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. There were, some, uh, there were some present at that very time who told him, that's Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Jesus says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he gives another example. Or, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all these others who lived in Jerusalem? And again, he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So twice in five verses, Jesus tells people to repent. What's happening is someone brought to Jesus a, a current event. There's a couple of events that took place. They're rather uh, terrible events, right? They're tragedies that took place. One is uh, apparently there were some worshipers bringing their sacrifices to the temple, and we're not sure what like, the context is, but uh, at some point, Pilate, probably some Roman soldiers, broke in and murdered them all. Like They're, they're there offering their sacrifices, the, the blood's being spilled for their, for their sin, and then all of a sudden, some soldiers roll in and just massacre all of the worshipers, and it says that it was so horrific that the blood like mingled with their sacrifices. It's a pretty gruesome, pretty awful episode that apparently people knew about and had heard about, and so Jesus is, is basically, that, that's one example, and then the other one is apparently a tower in Siloam. Uh, maybe it was under construction, but apparently it fell and it killed 18 people. These are pretty horrible, tragic events that took place that people were aware of. Now, there was some really bad theology, philosophy, ideology back in the day. Some still hold to this today that would say, because something awful happened to them, they must have had some really bad sin in their life because that's why that happened. That was the way they often thought. It was a pretty common, if something really bad happened to you or your family or a tragedy, the, the, the idea was you must have had some really deep, dark, hidden sin, and that's why those really bad things happened. So Jesus dispels that here in both of these episodes by saying, do you think because those bad things happened to them that like they're worse off? You think that they're like worse sinners than, than you? And, and then twice he says, no, I tell you, you all, like everyone, you must repent or perish also, okay? Twice, Jesus calls people to repentance. It's not about whether a tragedy happens or something bad happens, like we're all sinners, we all need repentance. And so Jesus says, repent or likewise. Here's what Jesus is essentially saying. You can't be a follower of Christ, you cannot be a follower of Jesus without practicing repentance in your life. You just can't. You can't be a follower of Jesus without practicing repentance. Um, I know that for some of us, 
we've kind of been led to believe that salvation is solely and only about like a cognitive belief in some things. Like if I just believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose from the grave, that's it. And listen, that is certainly part of salvation. You must believe that Jesus died. You must believe that uh, his great sacrifice for you and that he rose again. Yes, that's all true. We need to believe those things. But we also need to repent from our sin. Salvation starts with an acknowledgement that we're broken and that we're sinners and we can't save ourselves or fix ourselves. And so Jesus is going to say that repentance is absolutely necessary to be a follower of Jesus. Repentance is the mark of a believer. One of the most famous things that ever happened in the history of the church um, was what's called the Protestant Reformation. Um, I don't have time historically to kind of unpack everything going on in that moment, but essentially a man named Martin Luther who um, began to just read scripture as he, he was very highly educated and read scripture, and he just started to notice some areas in which the church had kind of gotten off a little bit, um, what he believed had gotten off from the teaching of scripture the plain teaching of scripture. And so he posts famously 95 thesis on the door of the church, okay? Um, now, posting something on the door of the church in that day and time, that would have been like putting it on a bulletin board for the whole community to see, right? It, was, it, it became a really big deal, okay? And so this kicked off what's called the Protestant Reformation where the church began to, to, to change in some ways and there was actually a bit of a divide or a split. Um, of the 95 thesis, I was reminded this week of the very first one. Of the whole list, 95 areas in which he felt the church had gotten off and away from Scripture, and the very first one, number one of the 95 posted on the door, Martin Luther said this, our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, when he said, repent ye, willed that the whole life of believers should be one of repentance. The whole 95 thesis, where he started, was where he felt the church had gotten away from that salvation comes through repentance and that our lives should be marked by repentance. And instead, the church was like charging money for people to confess and repent of their sin. And so this was a big area of contention. Martin Luther is basically saying, like, like according to, to him, according to scripture, the mark of a believer is repentance because we're sinners and we need repentance. And so what I want to do in just the brief time we have is I want to kind of walk through what, what does repentance look like for us? It's a word we've probably heard before. It's not always comfortable and easy to talk about because, again, it starts with us going, yeah, we're pretty messed up. But if we're going to walk with Jesus, we have to be people that repent and know what it means to repent. And so um, basically, I just want to kind of walk through. I've heard them called the three C's of repentance, if it helps you to kind of remember these, this, these elements of repentance um, and so the first one is this, the first step to repentance, to true, biblical, genuine repentance is confession. Confession. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Pretty familiar text of scripture. Here's what it says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he, that's God, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So John is declaring, like, if you're in your stubborn pride saying, I'm not that bad, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm, I'm not a sinner, then, then you have made God to be a liar, right? You're, you're calling God a liar. Now, maybe you're okay with that. I would be very uneasy calling God a liar, right? And so this is where repentance starts. It starts with confession. We confess our sins to a really good God who loves us. And then the promise of the gospel as we confess our sin is that he is faithful and he's just and he'll forgive us of our sin. That's good news, right? Like it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the skeletons in your closet. The truth and, and then what scripture just declared is that as you confess that, God can forgive that. God's already paid for that. He's already died on a cross for your sin. It's paid for. Our response, our first step is to confess it. So we confess our sin to God. We don't adamantly stand by stubbornly saying, I'm not a sinner. No, we openly say, here's my sin. And we drag it into the light. Now, um, that's kind of one aspect is confessing your sin to God. Now, James is going to say something that's even a little bit harder. In James chapter five, verse 16, here's what James says. James says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Now that's a little harder, isn't it? Confess your sins to one another. You see, I can, I can confess my sins to God because God's not going to talk to everybody else about it, right? But when James says we're also supposed to confess to other people, that can be a problem. So what does this mean, right? What does this look like? Am I supposed to like confess all of my sin to everybody? Some of y'all know that person. You ever hear that person? That person that just, they're an open book. Their life is an open book. They'll talk about anything and everything. They don't care. Like everyone in the world is their accountability partner, right? You, you, know, you know that person? Awkward, right? Um, this is not a blanket verse telling you that you need to confess all of your sin to everybody, okay? I would say this. I think in context, James actually ties this to prayer. So here's what I would say. We all need some people in our lives that we can be honest and real with and confess our sin to. People that are gonna pray for us and support us and encourage us, okay? Maybe it's one other person, maybe it's a small group of other people, but we need some people in our lives that we can confess our struggles and our hurts and the areas in which, man, we are prone to wonder and prone to weakness. We need some godly people in our lives that can help us in that area, okay? Confession at the end of the day is about dragging your sin from darkness where we all like to kind of keep it, right? If I can keep my sin you know, hidden where nobody needs to know about it, then, then, then I'm safe. Confession is about dragging it from the darkness into the light. And we confess it to God so that he forgives us, but we also need to confess it to some others so they can pray for us and support us and encourage us. Every one of us has areas of our life where we, are, where we struggle, okay? None of us are, are beyond that. And so James is encouraging us in the church that we find that other brother or sister in Christ that we can be honest and confess because that's what happens when you drag it from the darkness into the light. You're never gonna get over your sin. You're never gonna get past it. You're never gonna get through it until we can first confess it and drag it from the darkness into the light. That's, that's step number one. And then a really beautiful thing happens when we do that. One more passage under confession over in Psalm, um, Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is a Psalm of David. David was the greatest king in Israel's history. David was considered a man after God's own heart, and yet David had some significant areas of sin in his life. Uh, David, um, I mean, some of you, I don't have time to go back in Samuel and read the whole story, but David basically um, commits adultery or maybe even assault with uh, the wife of one of his generals. And then he ultimately, after the affair, she gets pregnant and then he has him murdered. I mean, it was some pretty awful, awful stuff that David did. And then for the better part of a year, uh, David thought it was hidden. He thought he had taken care of the problem and it was hidden and nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it until Nathan the prophet comes to him and points out, convicts him of his sin. And then David confesses it. David finally confesses it. He, he opens up about his sin. He drug it from the darkness into the light. And in Psalm 32, and Psalm 51 we'll look at in a little bit, but Psalm 32 is David after he has finally confessed his sin and made that right before God. And as I read this, I want you just to listen to the tone. I want you to listen to the weight that is lifted off of David as he, as he drags his sin into the light. Psalm 32, verse one. David says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Listen to verse three. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as in the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Do you hear the tone in that? And for the better part of a year, David kept it hidden. He kept it silent. Nobody knew about it. He thought, no one, no one needs to know. No one needs to know. And you know, the problem is, it was just eating away at him. It was just wearing on him. He said, your hand was like heavy upon me. My bones were like dried up. He, he was struggling under the weight of this unconfessed sin. So finally, David drags it into the light. Listen, this is step one of repentance. If we're gonna be people that walk with the Lord and practice repentance, the mark of a Christian, something Jesus called us to do, step number one is we've gotta practice confession. We confess to a good God who's ready, willing, and able to forgive. We confess and we confide in some trusted brothers and sisters who can help us 
who can hold us accountable, who can be praying for us and encouraging us. Step number one is confession. Step number two is contrition. Contrition. This is a sorrow or a brokenness over your sin, right? Where you acknowledge that you're sin, but you're, it's also like you feel it a little bit, right? It actually, you're actually um, broken in some way over your sin. You're genuinely sorry for what you've done. Um, I was thinking about this this week. Now, if you have children, uh, multiple children in particular, I don't know, hypothetically, let's just say that one of your children, for no reason, just smacks one of your other children. Now, my kids would never do that because I'm a perfect parent, but I'm sure some of you have dealt with that before, right? Just for no reason, one kid just smacks the other kid. And then when that happens, what happens? You, you, you say as a parent, hey, you need to apologize to your brother. And what do they do? Sorry. <laughs> About how it goes? Sorry. Now, are they really sorry? No. In fact, they might have said sorry, but you can tell in their tone what they really meant was, I will do it again in a heartbeat, right? <laughs> that's, that's what they meant by that, right? When you just go, sorry, you don't really mean it, right? You don't really mean it, okay? This is the way some people, you know, apologize to God, right? It's like, sorry, but you don't really mean it, right? That's not contrition. Contrition is an actual brokenness over your sin. Contrition is where you actually go, man, my sin hurts God. I don't want to walk in that stuff anymore. And there's a genuine sorrow, a genuine brokenness over what you have done. That's contrition, right? It's not a flippant, take it lightly, who really cares? It's, it's where it kind of weighs on you. Like it's, it actually means something, where there's some sorrow, there's some brokenness over your sin. I mentioned Psalm 51. Psalm 51, I think, whenever I preach on repentance, I always want to go to Psalm 51. I think it's probably the greatest um, passage really in all of the Bible on repentance. It's, it's King David again after this, um, this, this situation with Bathsheba and Uriah, um, and his sin has clearly weighed on him. And I'm going to read just um, Psalm 51, part of it here. And I want you again just to, to hear the contrition in David's, in David's voice here. Here's what he says. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit." And do you hear the contrition in David? This is not a man who is taking his sin lightly or casually any longer. This is a man who is owning it and he feels broken over it. It hurts David that, that, that his sin hurts God. This is a beautiful picture of actual contrition, of brokenness, of sorrow over your sin. The first step in repentance is confession, where you drag it from the darkness into the light. The second step is contrition where there's actual sorrow and brokenness over your sin. And then finally, the third aspect of biblical repentance is change, is change. Repentance leads to change. Repentance is essentially the fact that you're going one direction towards sin, away from God, and you recognize and you turn, you make a turn, you make a change, you begin to turn around and go the other way. That's what repentance is. Repentance is incomplete without change, okay? Repentance is incomplete without change. So many times we can confess and you know, say, oh yeah, I'm a sinner, I struggle. In some generalities, we confess. And we might even you know, feel some sorrow over that. Like, I don't wanna be that way, but I am. And so there's some sorrow there. But then where we kind of fall short with repentance is, is when, we, when we need to bring in some change, 
You see, change might require some actual steps to help make the change. Change might require, you know, you putting in some boundaries in your life. Change might require, you know, you, you, you might need some accountability in your life. Change might require you to actually do some things to bring about the change. And sometimes we're just real uncomfortable with that. But true repentance is incomplete without change. Back to Psalm 51, as David poured his heart out there in Psalm 51, then look what he says beginning in verse 13. Then, then, this is change, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering, but the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do you see the change there? David has confessed his sin, he's broken over his sin, and now David is going, God, I don't wanna be like that anymore. God, I wanna worship you. I want my, my lips to declare your praise. I want sinners, I wanna teach sinners your ways. Like, God, I wanna be different than I was. You see the change there? This is not David casually just going, oh, well, I messed up, no big deal. I'll probably do it again. No. This is David confessing, contrite, and committed to change. Now, I want to be careful here because I know what happens. Sometimes we struggle. with Just because you repent of your sin doesn't mean you're like never going to struggle with that thing again. And I know for a lot of us, we struggle with some things in our lives, and then we start to beat ourselves up and think that, man, God must hate me, I'm really awful, I'm terrible, there's guilt, there's shame. Um, and so I'm not saying that you're never gonna like, make a mistake again or you're never gonna accidentally take a, you know, a step backwards. The good news of the gospel is that you can always return to God who's got open arms, ready, willing, and able to forgive you. And as John 1, 9 said, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. So that's all good news, but there's gotta be a commitment to be different. There's gotta be a commitment to change if it's real and genuine repentance. To sin and to have no intention to ever be any different or to not be willing to put in the safeguards or the boundaries or the accountability, one could question whether you actually want to change or not. True repentance involves confession, where you drag it from the darkness to the light. It involves contrition, where there's brokenness and sorrow over your sin. We stop treating it too casually and too lightly. And finally, it involves a commitment to be different, to change, to turn around and go the other direction. Now, really quick, I just want to end with one more verse, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, because I want you to see where repentance should come from, where repentance should come from. Romans chapter two, verse four, the apostle Paul. Here's what he says. He says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness? That's God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Where does repentance come from? Repentance does not come from us beating up sinners and making them feel really, really bad. Repentance should not come from, you know, threats of hell and eternal damnation. And that's not where repentance should stem from. According to Paul, repentance should come from the kindness and the goodness and the graciousness and the patience of God. That you take a look at God and how unbelievably good God has been to you in spite of you, in spite of your sin, right? Like I look at my own life and go, God is unbelievably patient with me, right? Like, and so what that should do is that should drive me to repentance. The fact that God is so amazing and God is so good should drive me to places of repentance. But what Paul just said is, here's what happens too often. We presume upon the riches of God's goodness, right? So instead of letting his kindness and his goodness and his patience and his forbearance lead us to repentance, too often we go, God's good to me? I seem to be blessed? God must be okay with my life. God must be okay with my sin. I'm not, getting, I'm not getting struck down by lightning. I've got some blessings. God's good, God's patient, God's kind. I'm okay. That is presuming on the riches of God. That is presuming on the character of God. So listen, don't like misunderstand God's goodness and God's kindness towards you and God's patience towards you as somehow God's fine with all of your sin. God is never going to affirm your sin. He's not. And you should have no expectation that he do so. 
Instead, God's gonna be unbelievably good and gracious and kind to you. And the goal of God's character, the reason God is so good and so patient and so kind with us is ultimately that it would lead us to repentance, right? That's the purpose, that's the goal. Repentance is a mark of those who walk with the Lord. Repentance is necessary for salvation. You can't follow Jesus without practicing repentance. I've said it before, I'll say it again. We should imitate the way of Christ. We are Christians who bear his name, but the one thing you and I must learn to do regularly and consistently that Jesus never had to do is repent. Because you and I are sinners, and Jesus was not. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful today for the gift of repentance. And I know that sometimes it's not comfortable and easy to talk about because it starts with the fact that we're all pretty messed up. It starts with the fact that we're not okay, that we're not right, that we are broken. And so it's often hard to talk about repentance and sometimes it makes us a little uncomfortable. But God, if we think about it, I pray you'd remind us that it is a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. Because unlike tolerance, repentance doesn't just leave us where we are. Repentance leads us to change. Your love for us that wants the best for us doesn't just leave us in our brokenness and our sin. It requires change. It moves us to change. And so, God, we're grateful that you don't just tolerate us in our sin. We're grateful, God, that you require repentance because it makes us better. And it shows us that we're loved. So, God, today I pray for, God, anyone here that may be in a moment right now just wrestling and struggling with some sin that they've kept hidden for a long time. I pray today might be a day they would drag that sin from the darkness into the light. That they might practice confession. That you might break them over their sin. God, that they might desire change in their heart. Jesus, we thank you today for the fact that you've already gone to a cross and you've died on the cross in our place. You've died for our sin. God, the very sins that we have a hard time dragging into the light, you've already paid for them. Like, you've already paid the price. We don't have to pay for those sins. We just have to repent of them. So I pray you'd help us. God, you'd give us grace to be people that repent, that walk with you. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means we try to walk with you as your children. We pray this today in the powerful name of Jesus.